book of Lamentations, the book right after Jeremiah, which we finished last week. The book of Lamentations is made up of five chapters. That's what it looks like to us in the English Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, it's a little more involved than that. Because each of the five chapters is an individual poem in uh, the Hebrew language. And the first uh, four of the poems are acrostics. That is, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and each verse begins with a succeeding letter of the alphabet. We were to do an acrostic poem ourselves. We begin the first verse with A, and then the second with B, and C, and so forth. Well, that's what the first four are in in the um, of the five. The fifth poem, the fifth chapter, is not an acrostic. It has 22 verses, so you would think that it would be because that's comparable to the other verses, number of verses in the other uh, chapters. But it's not an acrostic. Chapter 3 has 66 verses in it, and it's an acrostic, though, because it takes three verses there. Uh, Jeremiah does uh, per letter of the Hebrew alphabet to lay out his poem that he lays out. Uh, it is undoubtedly Jeremiah who is the writer of Lamentations. The parallels between uh, the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations is very strong. In the book of Jeremiah and in Lamentations, the author uh, describes his tears as streams of water. Uh, he speaks of being confined in a pit. He was an eyewitness of uh, Jerusalem's destruction. All of these things fit Jeremiah. And uh, really, there is no other candidate on the horizon other than Jeremiah for the writing of the book of Lamentations. Uh, you would think that if a person had to write five poems or four out of the five as acrostics, that that would be a limiting kind of way to write something. But, you know, it wasn't just Jeremiah writing here as the Holy Spirit writing. And so what comes out is very magnificent. The timing of the writing of the Book of Lamentations, probably written immediately following the fall of Jerusalem uh, to the uh, Babylonians in 586 B.C. That's the timing of it. And that's the theme of all five poems. The theme of all five poems uh, was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. So uh, the writer of the Book of Lamentations, it seems there are portions that he's writing here where he sees the city even yet on fire, still burning. So he writes his lamentation uh, while it's in the, the throes of its destruction, and uh, Jeremiah probably wrote it prior to being uh, taken into Egypt. Uh, the book of Lamentations describes the uh, mourning of Jeremiah at the destruction of Jerusalem. There are some of, uh, of us that might think after 40 years of, I mean, just pouring his heart, mind, and soul and strength out to the Jewish people to turn from their sin, to turn from their rebellion. Uh, you'd think that maybe uh, there would be some, you know, I told you so, or some elation over it or anything like that, but there's none of that in him at all. He's completely heartbroken over what it is that has happened. Not heartbroken and that he judges God for the judgment that came, uh, but heartbroken that the people never did turn. I mean, imagine warning over and over again for 40 years, no one turns, and then you see the destruction. It would be uh, heartbreaking if you've ever dealt with it, uh, a, a believer, and uh, told them over and over and over and over again, this is what's coming, this is where this path leads to, turn from it, turn from it, and then they don't, and they end up bearing the consequences of that rebellion against God, and, and when they do, there's no joy in it, there's no I told you so, it's just it's heartbreaking. Uh, that there wasn't a repentance prior to that. These uh, five poems are interesting in that um, three of them, uh, chapter 1, 2, and 4, uh, 
are more than just poems, they're funeral songs. Uh, Jeremiah really writes down kind of three songs for the funeral of Jerusalem because each one of those chapters begins with the word how. And oftentimes in a lamentation that was given at the time of someone's funeral, there would be that beginning of the statement with how. Uh, probably the most famous in the entirety of the Bible was King David's lamentation over Jonathan and David when, uh, or Jonathan and Saul when he cried out and he said, how the mighty are fallen. And so it was a way to begin kind of a funeral a uh, dirge or a, a funeral lamentation. And uh, this book has as its theme, uh, it continues the theme of Jeremiah, and that it is still uh, calling for God's people to repent of any and all sin. That means us tonight, reaches all the way down through the age and, and calls God's people to repent of all sin because it reveals the end of, of all, uh, all sin. In chapter 1, uh, Jerusalem is wiped out and uh, Jerusalem laments her rebellion against God and uh, her willful disobedience against God's word and her rebellion against uh, God's warnings. And everyone lives to lament uh, their disobedience in their life or their willful rebellion against God. And so... Chapter 1 really brings out the consequences of sin. Um, one of the uh, frequent observations, and it's a fair observation, to make concerning much of what is called entertainment in the United States uh, is that so much of the television and so much of the movies that goes forth, there is the romanticizing of sin. And there is a failure, and to me, it is nothing less than criminal today. And, and apart from repentance, I will not want to be in these, the shoes of these men and women on the day in which uh, the judgment comes forth. But the romanticizing of sin and the failure to bring forth accurately the consequences of sin. And so much of the television and the movies, and you can take it on anywhere you want in terms of entertainment, there's the glorification of sex and the, and the sexual appetite. And, and so here it is, it all looks fun, it all, you know, it's all young bodies and young this and all this and everything that's put forward and everything that's there to entice the flesh but never does it, or rarely does it, then show the consequences of that lifestyle and that action. Rarely does it show the unwanted pregnancy. It doesn't show the girl carrying now that baby to term, and the guy long gone. And now the very hard life that follows that. And it doesn't show the sexually transmitted diseases. It doesn't show the loss of innocence and the effect that that can have upon relationships that come later. It does not show the consequences of sin. So much of just pure violence and wrath and anger, it's, it's brought forth as this wonderful thing, this macho kind of a thing, but then it doesn't show the consequences of it that if a young boy or a young man, and they are oftentimes most prone to this, were to ever on the smallest scale begin to live out the kind of life in terms of wrath and anger that's put before them on the screen, that they'll be incarcerated overnight. Uh, There are going to be horrible consequences related to that, but never is it shown, or rarely is it shown. But where this world is criminal in its negligence, God is never negligent to lay out the consequences of rebellion against Him. And the Bible teaches that the way of the transgressor is hard. And the transgressor is more than just a sinner. The life of sin is hard enough. 
The transgressor is the one who knows what God says and says, I don't care. I'm going to rebel against it anyway and do what I want. God says, that is a hard life. And that's what the children of Israel did, and that's what Jerusalem did. And chapter 1 is in graphic detail a description by God of the consequences of their rebellion against him. And it's the same consequences that we bear uh, any time that we would want to decide to rebel against him. So, in verse 1, How lonely sits the city, speaking of Jerusalem, that was full of people. How great, or how like a widow is she who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. And so the first consequence was uh, loneliness, he describes here. And the nation had become lonely now. And he uses the image of loneliness as the widow. Now, the widow's life is a lonely life. Many times, even in this culture, and we have a culture where there's a lot of connection with other people. But in that ancient culture, to be widowed was to be left apart from your family, to be largely alone the rest of, of your life. It was a, a widow was a picture of loneliness. Now, the sad thing here is that the children of Israel had been called by God to be the wife of the Lord. In other words, God had espoused the children of Israel to him as a husband. And because he was their husband, he knew that he would be a husband who would never die on them. Not physically, but spiritually. That he would always be there for them. He would never disappoint them. They would never become lonely uh, as, as one who was wedded to him but they decided to marry themselves to all of these other gods that could die, and thus they ended up lonely. That city that was once vibrant now completely wiped out. Verse 2. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. And so Jerusalem became betrayed. They were forsaken. They were abandoned. And that was a consequence of their rebellion against God. All of these lovers that she had left the Lord for, they all left her in her time of trouble. They're all gone now. But you know what the miracle of miracles is about verse 2 there? is that he stays with them. After 490 years of rebellion against him and his word, after 40 years of intensified scorning of the Lord and of his word, the very Lord that Israel and Jerusalem despised was the only one that stood with her and was the only one that still loved her. And it's amazing how gracious God is and how willing He is to humble Himself, to stand by us in our folly, even our folly where we're not living in willful rebellion against Him, how faithful He is to stand with us. You turn around, everyone else is gone. Everything else is gone. All of the goofy things that we went for in some moment or period of folly, and we turn around, and who's the one that stuck with us and humbled himself to be able uh, to do that? And so there's the Lord. They had treated him like dirt. They had scorned him, all of these things. And yet, when they hit rock bottom, there he was. There he was standing there with him. I'll tell you, that's the kind of love that humbles you, isn't it? It really humbles you when you experience that kind of love from the Lord, and we all do. And verse 3, Judah has gone into captivity. 
under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her in dire straits. And so the additional consequence of her rebellion was bondage and captivity. Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She wanted the world instead of God. And so God says, I have a cure for that. And the cure that I have for that is, I'll give you the world. And I'll give you the world until you're so sick of the world that you'll turn back to me. They gave themselves completely to the world and the things of the world. And the problem was that they couldn't find any rest there. And that's the beautiful thing about God's people. And the beautiful thing about our lives. And that is, is that because we know the Lord, because we've experienced Him, because He's with us, because He indwells us, He's called us, we have been wonderfully and marvelously spoiled for the world. You can go back, but you'll find no rest there. Praise the Lord. You'll only find torment there. It's been ruined for us. And it's important to remember that as it puts all of its sparklers and all of its lights. You see the lights going up on some of the houses, you know, for Christmas time. And uh, it was very nice that some people waited till after Halloween to do that this year. Can't quite want to get Thanksgiving out of the way, but I mean, that lights go up and all. But they try to put these fancy lights on the sin and all of this, make it flash and everything. But we've been ruined for it. We'll never be able to enjoy sin like we once enjoyed it, and we didn't enjoy it the first time. And and so all there was was just the bondage that would be found there. I love in Psalm 106, uh, verse 15, you might make note of it in your notes, but the Lord talked about a time where he was dealing with the children of Israel prior to bringing them into the promised land, and they're wandering in the wilderness. And the Lord said he gave them their request, but he sent leanness into their soul. They got what they wanted. But they, what they wanted was far less than what they thought it would be, and it ended up being leanness of soul. Verse 4, the roads to Zion mourn because no one comes to the set feasts. All her gates are desolate, her priests sigh, her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. And so the consequence of, of their rebellion was their roads were now pilgrimless. No one was going to Jerusalem. No one was going to attend the feasts. It's interesting that Jerusalem didn't want to hear God's word and that she didn't want to serve the Lord. Uh, she didn't want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so the Lord just said to Jerusalem, all right, if all of those things that are so dear to me are so tedious to you, so limiting to you, then I'll relieve you of them. And they had no idea the price that they would pay for that. I like what one man said. He said, if God's people do not value what he entrusts them with, he will teach them its worth by taking it from them. He said, if God's people do not value what he entrusts them with, he'll teach them its worth by taking it from them. And that's what he did. They didn't value the assembling together of the saints. They didn't value the Word of God. They didn't value any of these things. And so God said, I know a way to produce the right attitude towards these things, and that is to not even give you the opportunity to enjoy those things. Then in verse 5, her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy, and so she became ruled by her adversaries. If I'm not going to be ruled by God, then all that's left to be ruled by is my adversaries. And uh, we have an adversary that we don't want to have ruling us, and so they had become her master. You know, it's like Dylan said a long time ago, you know, we're going to serve the devil or we're going to serve the Lord, but we're going to serve somebody. 
And, uh, and I hope tonight, before he goes to bed, that every single thing that he sang during that period in his life echoes in his mind. <laughs> so uh, we get him back on the straight and narrow. Uh, verse 6. And from the daughter of Zion, all her splendor has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture, that flee without strength before her pursuer. And so all of her former splendor uh, had departed from her and uh, was now gone. It is interesting that when you look at a backslider, uh, how quickly the former splendor is gone. Uh, the joy of the Lord, the life that's there, the color that's in a person's face, the the whole thing. You you look at someone that's backslidden, and I mean, you run into them, and you 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 say, "Is that you?" I mean, it, it, it they wear it on their countenance, they wear it in every way. Some people are unrecognizable in two weeks. I'm convinced that I would be if I backslid from the Lord, be unrecognizable to anyone in two weeks, and so. They had lost that that splendor, had departed from their life, and that's a terrible price to pay uh, for a rebellion against God and for the sake of seeking after sin. Verse 7, In the days of her affliction and roaming, Jerusalem remembers all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the enemy, with no one to help her, the adversaries saw her and mocked at her downfall. And so, here's an additional consequence, verse 7. Now, you kind of got a hunch I'm going to have 22 of these, right, in this chapter? All right. I knew I was dealing with a sharp group here. I knew it. And so, what's he saying here is, is the seventh consequence, a life of regret. A life of regret. Jerusalem remembers all of her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. And that's one of the hardest things to live with is what if, oh, what I once had, what I once was, what God was once doing, and all of those things. And you see here, God comes in with the strength of all of this and, and says, now these are the consequences. Weigh the consequences before a decision is made to backslide uh, against him. And so there's that life of regret, that life where you, you can spend so much of your life, you know, dreaming about the past, what I once was, what I once did, how God was working, those kinds of things. And that's a terrible affliction, uh, is a part of backsliding. In verse 8, Jerusalem has sinned grievously, and therefore she has become vile, and all who honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness, yes, she sighs and turns away. And so Jerusalem became vile, and she became despised by her enemies. Now, um, in that ancient culture, we've certainly lost sight of that today, but in, in ancient culture of Israel, uh, to have your nakedness uncovered, to be exposed, uh, was uh, one of the highest... Um, disgraces. I mean, it was a, a humiliating kind of, of thing. And yet, that's what he describes as, as happening to Jerusalem uh, as it relates to these nations that were uh, around her. Um, it's interesting to me there in verse 8 that concerning the nations that surround her, if I can be this graphic, um, the Jerusalem is pictured as a woman, and the surrounding nations are pictured as men. And the idea is that once these men got what they wanted, then they despised her, and then they rejected her afterwards. And uh, that's the way that it is with, in the spiritual realm, following after false gods and all of these things, is that so often, once the devil has you, once he gets that enjoyment for whatever it might be, then there's the despising. I think it's also important, uh, just on a purely physical realm, to realize that as men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit, 
and walking with the Lord, that gives you an attractiveness in this world. You're the only ones that have it in the world. And it's a fragrance you wear. There's a freshness that you wear. There's an innocence that you wear as a result of walking with the Lord and uh, living for the Lord. And that makes you very attractive, not just to the Lord and not just to God's people, but also to those that are in the world. And it's interesting how they can then come into your life attracted by who you are and what you are spiritually, the purity of it, and then once they've been able to have you in some way, then they forget you. Now you're no better than they are, no better than anything else around them, and they forget very, very quickly. And that's what happened to an entire city of Jerusalem uh, as it related to that. They, they didn't realize uh, what was attractive about them, and they, they threw it away and, and then found themselves uh, thrown away in, in just a moment. Verse 9, Her uncleanness is in her skirts. She did not consider her destiny. Therefore, her collapse was awesome. And she had no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. And so, because of her rebellion, there was uncleanness in her skirts. Now, what that was a reference to was the menstrual cycle, which the bleeding of the menstrual cycle under the law of Moses rendered a woman ceremonially unclean. And the point that Jeremiah is making here is that because of their idolatry, they became unclean. And they forgot their destiny. When a woman was ceremonially unclean, when she would come into contact with another human being, she would render them for a time ceremonially unclean. In other words, every contact with her made people unclean. So God takes this image into the spiritual realm. Their destiny was that God wanted His people to come into contact with the people of the world and for the influence to be not to render them unclean, but to be a cleansing influence. But they threw away that opportunity in order to engage in their sin, and instead they became like everything else in the world, and that is what defiles. And so, uh, you know, some of the most amazing kind of defilement in, in all uh, oftentimes can come from the person that is living in rebellion to God and knows uh, better what damage can be done through that kind of a life. Verse 10, the adversary has spread his hand over all her pleasant things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you commanded not to enter your congregation. And so the temple was looted, the temple was violated. Uh, the Babylonian soldiers, they just stomped as a conquering force, not only into the temple, but they stomped straight into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of the Ark of the Covenant there in the temple. And so uh, they were looted and violated as a result of their rebellion. How many Christians in a backslidden state end up looted I mean, all of the resources gone and, and tragically violated in, in a spiritual way. Verse 11, all her people sigh, they seek bread, they have given their valuables for food to restore life. See, O oh Lord, and consider, for I am scorned. And so, eleventh consequence was famine and uh, just the hunger and uh, starving. Verse 12, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted on me in the day of his fierce anger. And so the twelfth consequence was sorrow. And uh, here is Jerusalem speaking to the nations or the people that were passing by about the sorrow that they were in, in the midst of and uh, the brokenheartedness that they were suffering because of, of the needlessness. 
of, of all of it. Now, the interesting thing about verse 12 is that if you fast forward about 600 years, uh, this statement of verse 12 can just as easily be spoken by the Lord Jesus when he came to Jerusalem and wept over that city. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted on me in the day of his fierce anger, because Jerusalem did not know the day of their visitation when Jesus came in as the Messiah into the city of Jerusalem. It also applies very, very appropriately to the cross of Calvary. Jesus could easily have declared this concerning his sorrow. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief there from that cross. Verse 13, from above he has sent fire into my bones. And this is not fire in the highest sense of the word in terms of zeal. It has the idea of disease, fever. From above he has sent fire into my bones and it overpowered them. He has spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He has made me desolate and faint all of the day. And so one of the consequences of their rebellion was the disease that came in, the sickness that came in uh, among the people. And how often rebellion against the Lord results in sickness and fever and fire in the bones. And how easily it is to pick up some kind of a disease today in a backslidden state, in a rebellious state, and the diseases are fierce. Just reading a series in the Chronicle about uh, epidemics of the world. This is this is casual reading for me. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I like these melancholy subjects, but um, reading it really from the vantage of an end time scenario around the world, and I mean, it's just like <laughs> you watch the news and you read the newspapers, and even for me, and I'm a news a holic. I, I love it. And yet, even I hit a place where I say, that's enough. I can't know anymore. I can't know anymore. My wife has a far lower threshold. She doesn't want to know anymore. And I read the newspaper, and I say, honey, let me tell you this story. I don't want to hear it. She knows it's going to be some tragedy of some kind. I say, you can't believe this. You really want to know this story. I don't want to know. And I try everything I can to get some, just the slightest bit of curiosity. I'll pay you a dollar if you let me tell you the story, you know. And, uh, and nothing at all. She doesn't want to hear it, you know. And, and, uh, and, you know, some of you understand that on some level. But they talk about the diseases and now the writing off of entire continents now. As, as it relates to, to diseases and, and how fearful it is. One article that I read recently in Newsweek, because yeah, I even subscribed to magazines to depress me. And uh, I was reading Newsweek and they were talking about, uh, the, recently the unfounded concerns of overpopulation. And, and now this whole thing is, is turned around where some of the experts are looking and saying, we really don't have to worry about overpopulation. Because this earth itself is going to take vengeance on this population. It will exact its own judgment of, of the mishandling of the resources of the world and, and the diminishing of the population through the disease and so, through the different ways that, that man is, is brought upon himself in, in his sin. And so, uh, but, but so tragic when a person will rebel against the Lord and then end up picking up some kind of a disease. And so many of them now, of course, uh, very, uh, very much terminal. Verse 14. Again, the theme of the chapter is not to depress those of us in the room tonight that fall under one of these 22 verses. But you know, God must find himself in a straight betwixt two, because surely I find myself in that place. And that is, how do you not condemn the group that's before you and yet sufficiently warn the group that can still be warned? 
so that they don't have to experience a first hand and become a casualty. We have enough casualties in the body of Christ. God works it together for good as we walk with Him. But here He comes with the fullness of His force, uh, of the consequences, and I'm, I'm glad that, that He does. I'm, you know, I'm glad as a pastor, I'm glad as a parent, I'm glad as a, an adult in, in, in this culture and, and, and in this world. Verse 14, the yoke of my transgressions uh, was bound. They are woven together by his hands. In other words, now they've, one of the consequences was their sin, they were yoked to it. Now they became servants to it. And thrust upon my neck, he made my strength fail. The Lord delivered me into the hands of those whom I am not able to to understand. And so now here's Jerusalem. She loved her sin so much and uh, so she ended up firmly yoked and tied to that sin. And uh, now she finds that she's unable to deliver herself. And that's the way that it is with sin. It always begins with that kind of a deal. <laughs> it's like, hey, hey, Grand Poobah of spirituality. Yes? You know what I mean? Anything that tweaks our pride? Yes? Is it well, you can handle a little of this in your life, you know, and that kind of a thing. Is it, well, you know, I suppose my brethren cannot, but I think I can. And, uh, you know, this gets introduced into my life and all this. And then pretty soon you turn around and not too short of an order, and all of a sudden this thing has me uh, severely in bondage. And that's the way that sin operates, James told us in James chapter 1. And uh, it has its goal of uh, entrapping us, ensnaring us, and then killing us, sin, killing us spiritually in our relationship with the Lord and then bringing death physically uh, into our lives. Now, one of the real cures for sin, and surely one of the real cures for the world's attempt to romanticize sin, is to be given the opportunity to have my fill of it. Have all of it that you want in whatever area. A lot of people, they spend most of their life thinking that if I could just get all I wanted of this one, you know, big sin in my life, then I, you know, die a happy camper here on 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 planet Earth. And then the person gets it, and it becomes a nightmare. And it becomes a nightmare because sin always involves bondage. It always involves bondage. Sin does not exist on planet Earth as a means of giving pleasure to the flesh. There's always a hook with sin. And Satan is very careful to keep the hook hidden. Uh, so I think that uh, fish are smarter than us at times. I think he can show about half the hook and catch uh, more of us than we no sh- Please, don't raise your hand. And I'm not thinking of anyone in this room at the moment as it relates to that. But there's always that hook. It's It's always there ultimately to put me in bondage and to, to lead me uh, someplace. Again, in the children of Israel, in the wandering of the wilderness, God was providing for them wonderfully. I mean, they had these sandals that never wore out. It was a bad time to own stock and shoes. I mean, this is, these just lasted. These were 40-year shoes. And God took care of their clothing, and um, he fed them with manna. And uh, after a little while, they didn't like manna. You know, they don't like it. You know, we have this manna. We eat this manna all the time. We put it in the blender. And we, you know, we have this to it. And all the manna. They got sick of the manna. They started to complain about the manna. They said, we want quail. We like quail. Moses says to God, they want quail. I said, all right, I'll give them quail. God brought a quail in. whole thing of quail. Covey of quail. Millions of coveys of quail. They came in on the wind. They came in just, I mean, just at the right height to bat them down about this high. And all they had to do is have something. And boom, just knock those guys right down there. And the Bible says that each one, the one that gathered the least, gathered ten homers. There's a Mark McGuire kind of a thing there, right in the deal. Huh? Some Old Testament humor for you. Huh? Some people say the Old Testament doesn't have any humor. It sure it does, right in there. Well, anyway, so they gather all these baskets of quail. And they ate the quail till it was coming out of their nostrils. Now, there's a picture that I don't want to ever have anyone paint for me out of the Old Testament. But it was coming out of their nostrils. They wanted quail. They weren't content with. And then there was a plague associated 
with that quail. But uh, say, oh, you know, if I can just have whatever until it's coming out of my nostrils. No, there's death there as it relates to sin. And so, uh, but that's what they wanted, and uh, they ended up enslaved to it. Verse 15, the Lord has trampled underfoot all my mighty men in my midst. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord trampled as in a wine press the virgin daughter of Judah. And so Judah ended up trampled, and she's likened to a trampled wine press. All of the grapes in the bottom, and they're all smashed, and the carnage and the, everything. And that's what uh, Jerusalem ended up uh, looking like because the enemy was able to come in at her invitation and destroy her. For these things I weep. My eye, my eye overflows with water because the comforter who should restore my life is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy uh, prevailed. And so her portion now in verse 16 became uh, weeping. It was a life of weeping. Verse 17, Zion spreads out her hands but there is no one to comfort her. And so she was comfortless, verse 17. And the Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that those around him become his adversaries. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. And so she became comfortless and she became unclean. Verse 18 comes her confession. The Lord is righteous, for I rebelled against his commandment. Hear now all peoples, and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. So here is Jerusalem's confession there in verse 18, that God was righteous in his judgment against us, and we were wrong in our rebellion against him. And so that really is a beautiful verse in verse 18. In every single believer that rebels against the Lord and every single backslider against the Lord ultimately makes the confession of verse 18 and that is he was right and I was wrong there's the confession he was right in everything that he said about me everything that he said about sin and we received and I received what was due my sin one of the great choruses that will be sung during the Great Tribulation in the book of Revelation, it's repeated over and over again in the Revelation, a single chorus, and it goes something like this, Righteous and true are your judgments. And it's sung to God. In other words, by the time everything is brought out into the open as it relates to every single thing that God has done, the cry that will be cried to God is, God, you were absolutely right in you did, when what you did, and you were completely true in what you did. Righteous and true are your judgments. And if God is forced to judge any person because they have rejected the salvation that God's provided in his Son, then when the day comes, when all of the facts are known, and that person is judged then for their rebellion against God and His salvation, there won't be a single cry against the judgment of God. All that's going to be cried out in heaven is righteous and true are your judgments. I don't know about you, can't speak for you, but I deserved hell. And I deserved an eternal lake of fire and I deserved all of that and more. I have no complaint as it relates to the judgment of God and His assessment of me and what was my due for eternity. I don't have a single complaint about it at all. And I have this sneaking suspicion that the other five and a half billion people that live on this planet with me are just like me. And that is vile and disgusting inside and out, apart from God. Boy, where'd that come from? <laughs> but, but that's the way that we are. And all of us are like that. And now I'm going to bring you into the, into the, you know, fold here now on that whole thing. But that's what we are, and, and we are due a, a, a judgment. And, uh, and then the worst judgment is then the height of pride to reject God's salvation. Now, it is commendable here in verse 18 that, that now 
There's no more blame shifting. They're not saying, well, God did this and God was so unfair here and all this kind of stuff that so often can go on when a person is bearing the consequences of their own sin. Uh, but now they're recognizing uh, that God was right and that they were wrong. And they're halfway there when a person gets into that place. Verse 19, I called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders breathed their last in the city while they sought food to restore their life. And so she ended up deceived. And uh, there comes that point in time in a rebellion against God that it dawns on the person that I've been deceived. And not always is it by some other person or some other group. Self-deception is just as effective in uh, getting us on that, that wrong path. And so uh, there's that uh, deception of thinking, I think, here in verse 19. And, and it's that common deception that sometimes occurs in, in people's lives. They say, oh, I'm walking with God. I'm living for God. I'm missing out on all of life, you know. God's, God's against me. God's word is against me. You know, for finding fulfillment in this life and all of that. And, and, and all of these other people and all these other things and all of these sins. These, they understand me. You know, this is where I can find fulfillment. And then, and then at the end of it to realize that God was the only one that was for me. He was the only one that was speaking the truth to me. And, and that's a difficult light when it goes on there in verse 19. Verse 20. See, O Lord, that I am in distress, my soul is troubled, my heart is overturned within me, for I have been very rebellious. Outside the sword bereaves, at home it is like death. And so there's that deep distress of soul uh, that she experienced. And then in verse uh, 21, they have heard that I sigh, with no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They're glad that you have done it. Bring on the day that you have announced that they may become like me. And so here is Jerusalem for her sin. And now there's the cry, God, then let your righteousness cut all the way across uh, mankind and bring judgment on these others that surround me. And of course, in the book of Jeremiah, God had promised that he would do that. He brought his judgment upon his people, but then he spoke of the judgment that would come upon the nations uh, surrounding, uh, just as she had cried out here in verse 21. And then in verse 22, Let all their wickedness come before you, and do to them as you have done to me, For all my transgressions, for all my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. So again, uh, desiring the judgment of uh, the nations that were around her. And I think it's a sad thing here as it relates to chapter 1. You look at the consequences, 22 verses of consequences. And those of you who are familiar with the Bible... And those of you who have been with us from Genesis on, to read the book of Deuteronomy and the promises 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 that God gave to these people. He laid the two paths before them, he said. He said, the one path is blessed. It's the path of obedience. And he says, if you just walk on that path of obedience, it is a path that is blessed. And he said, there's another path. It's the path of disobedience. And he told them up front, he said, it's cursed. And again, it wasn't so much where he was saying, I'm going to curse you on that path. It was, it is a curse unto itself. Put yourself on that path. I'm telling you ahead of time, there's nothing but a curse on that path. And and curses to be found there. And God spoke with such beauty, I mean, so poetically in in those books of how He wanted to bless them, how He wanted to bless their children, their generations, to give them all these things, and then for them to end up in this condition. And, and chapter 1 of Lamentations, I mean, the absolute opposite of what God had in mind for them, because what he had in mind for them was rest 
What he had in mind for them was safety. And, uh, and yet, they wouldn't obey him so that they could have a life of rest and safety. Um, <laughs> rest and safety in this world is a priceless thing. Someone was talking to me at the end of one of the services this morning. And uh, have you heard anything about Y2K recently? I haven't even begun to hear about Y2K. <laughs> Next year, sometimes people say, when are we going to talk about Y2K in the fellowship? Listen, we got a long time to talk about Y2K. If you got your bottled water today, it'd have algae in it by the time it hits next year. So the, the fact of the matter is, is that you and I are going to hear about Y2K every day for the next year. So God will give us wisdom and direction as it relates to these things. But the world is frantic. And when the Y2K thing passes, not only will the world move on to the next thing to make itself frantic over, but unfortunately, the body of Christ will too. As a people overall, we are determined to keep ourselves worked up and frenzied even in these last days. And God has told us, live the life of obedience. It's a life of rest, and it's a life of peace, and it's a life of safety. And I'll direct you as it relates to the legitimate things in life that are going to come our way. But again, so many frantic over so many kinds of things as if we were like everyone else in the world, which we are not. So the key thing is to obey him. And then he'll direct us related to these other things. I'm not saying not to buy groceries and keep your receipts and all of these things and some cash on hand, all that stuff that will probably be prudent as it relates to all of that hitting. But we can live a life of peace between now and then because as we obey the Lord, we have the freedom to live a life of peace because as we obey him, we're living a life of safety with him. And so here is Jerusalem so far away from, from what God had intended. And so I think, it's a, I think it's a very, very valuable chapter in the Word of God where it brings forth the consequences. I'll tell you, that needs to be spoken more. You, there needs to be grandfathers and grandmothers and mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and Sunday school teachers and pastors and neighbors and all that will take people aside and just say, think about what you're doing here. Think about what you're doing. When I was a little bit younger, there was a show that was on television, probably still is on the rerun stations. I have seven minutes. I'm going to fill it out with pure nonsense. So. But uh, there was a show on that was uh, called The Waltons. And uh, I, I would just watch the whole thing just to, just to hear him say good night at the end uh, on the thing. How many names? Good night, John Boy, and all that stuff. But one of the things that was attractive to me uh, was the grandfather. And, uh, you know, I don't know what he was in real life in terms of what kind of wisdom he had, so I'm just going to talk about the actor. But he would just speak some things that needed to be spoken into young lives at times. And, and that's a valuable thing. And that's the purpose of this chapter, just to say, listen, stop and think ahead of time of the consequences before you make that kind of a choice.